Well, good evening, folks. Uh, good evening to those of us here at Chris Pavilion, and good evening to all of you joining us remotely. My name is Dick Smythe, and I want very briefly to set the stage for our program tonight. And I will do that along with responding to a question some of you are no doubt asking, namely, how come? How come the Climate Change Coalition, along with our many partners, is sponsoring a program on the importance and health of soil, or more specifically, regenerative agriculture? So in response to that, let me suggest we take a little closer look at soil. Soil is one of nature's most perfect contradictions, a substance that is ubiquitous but unseen, humble but essential, surprisingly strong but profoundly fragile. It nurtures life and death. It undergirds cities, forests, and even oceans. And it feeds all terrestrial life on Earth. It is a substance very few people understand, and most simply take it for granted. Yet, yet it is arguably one of Earth's most critical resources. And humans, quite literally, owe to it their very existence. So soil is far more than dirt. Soil is alive. One tablespoon of fertile soil has been estimated to contain more organisms than people existing on Earth today. It has also been estimated that the population in the soil may consist of roughly 5,000 different mm -hmm. kinds of critters, 5,000 species. So soil not only feeds life on Earth, but it makes all animal life, our life included, possible. All of us animals, all of us, breathe oxygen. And what is oxygen? Oxygen is a byproduct of the photosynthetic process of plants making sugar. And what do plants require? Well, they require soil, of course. Now then, what group of people are most intimately connected to and concerned with soil? Well, heck, we all know the answer to that. It's farmers, of course. They work with soil every day. And why is the Climate Change Coalition concerned? The excess sugar, carbon, that green plants produce is stored in the surrounding soil. And even though much of that has been lost over the last 10,000 years of agriculture, there is still more carbon in the soil than in the atmosphere. And we need to add more to the soil. But the unity, the unity of soil everywhere is threatened by climate change and is exacerbated by certain farming practices. Atmospheric carbon is warming our planet. This increasing warmth, along with a host of related issues like droughts, floods, wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, are disrupting natural systems and threatening the human livability of planet Earth. So the question for us this evening is how do we most effectively feed our population, increase the carbon sequestered in the soil, and thus diminish the carbon in our atmosphere, along with the threat of a looming climate crisis that will 
spare not one of us. So at this point, my role as disabling is complete, except I do want to introduce the folks who are responsible for making this program possible. I want to thank them for their participation. Now, I have to say, we sorrowfully are lacking one of our panelists. At 4.30 this afternoon, we got a call that he was in the hospital with COVID. He hadn't been feeling well for a couple of days, went to the hospital, and he was diagnosed with COVID this afternoon. So unfortunately, unfortunately, our third panelist, who would have represented an organic farm, Mike Polich, cannot be here today. So I, I really regret that. And I, he does too, and his wife was very apologetic, but good land, you can't argue with getting, getting COVID. So, when I introduce you, if you would please raise your hand so the people looking and watching have some idea of who is who. So first, Lauren Bray. She represents Cycle Farm and Bray Family Beef. Shaw Fatke, representing Mighty Wind Farms. And Lee Kennard, representing Kennard Farms. They will tell you more about themselves and about their farms. And finally, our moderator tonight, where is she? <laughs> Our moderator tonight is Dr. Jamie Patton. Jamie is Senior Outreach Specialist for Northeast Wisconsin with the Nutrient and Pest Management Program of the University of Madison, or the University of Wisconsin, rather, Madison. Jamie and our panelists will help us understand how it is possible to promote conservation and agriculture what the International Journal of Ag and Biological Engineering has called the triple bottom line, economic, social, and environmental sustainability. How to deal with that, including the improvement of soil health. So Jamie, thank you for being here. The program is now yours. Sir. So our goals tonight, so we need to set out our goals. What do we want to do? We want to learn how farms of all sizes are adopting practices that promote soil health. So tonight I want to focus on soil health promoting practices. There are a lot of really new things going on there, out and old things. That's what's really fun about cover crops and composting that we're going to talk about tonight. We think of them as new, but they're very, very old. So we're excited to talk about and share what's going on out there in the landscape. We want to know how these cropping practices align with climate change mitigation. So why are we doing these practices? How are they helping us in the agricultural world adapt to these changing weather cycles that tend to be more intense than they have in years past, as well as helping to mitigate that greenhouse gas and have that opportunity to have that dialogue. So again, we've met our panelists. And thank you to our partners. So Dick didn't mention these. We have Peninsula Pride Farm, the Nature Conservancy, the Lakeshore Natural Resource Partnership, the Door County Master Gardeners, the Utilitarian and Universalist Fellowship of Door County, the Door Kiwani Demo Farms, and UW Extension. So we thank them for their support tonight. Although it doesn't seem like that my hard work to try and put a bunch of chairs in a room, it really is this technology. And I will recognize Whitney and Tom, who are sitting in the back, making sure that this all happens smoothly in this virtual world. I get to talk about what are healthy soils, and this is going to fall off, so what the heck. All right. Somebody asked, can I actually present without a soil pit? It is very, very difficult. All right. I would much rather be standing a little bit down in the ground talking to you about the wonders of soils and soil health, but we have to do it from our chairs today. So what is soil health? You can go with the official NRCS definition, but I like the definition, are our so soils doing what healthy soil should do. So I focus on the function. Are they functioning like a natural soil? And what does a natural soil function like? 
Well, are they cycling carbon and nutrients? What's really fun when we think about natural soils, when we think about 10,000 years ago, right, the glaciers would have just left this region and plants would have started to be taken hold and they would have gotten everything they need from that soil. So they would have been bringing carbon into the system through photosynthesis, as Dick described. They would have been extracting nutrients. So when we look at our systems, right, are those soils able to do that? Are they able to store carbon? Are they able to cycle carbon and release that energy through the microbial communities? Are they able to cycle nutrients appropriately to support plant growth? Lee always likes this, this quote. We were talking about this the other day. I worked with the NRCS, and so they did a study up in this northeast region looking at what the original, we're estimating, what the original soil organic matter levels were in northeast Wisconsin. So the NRCS soil scientists went out and they, they sampled well-drained upland soils that were under natural vegetation, right, under forest drive situation situations. And they found that in Doran, Kiwani County, the natural soil organic matter level may have been somewhere in that five, six, seven percent or higher. When I work with farms today, sometimes often we're in the two, three, four percent. So over the last 100, 150 years of agricultural production, what we've seen is our soil organic matter levels decline by half or more. We know that soil organic matter contains on average approximately 50% carbon. So when we look at that loss of organic matter, not only have we lost some function of allowing that soil to do what it wants to do, but we put more carbon back into the atmosphere. And we're going to talk about practices today that are old, that, are one, that were once old, but are new again to bring carbon back into that system using plants and livestock, particularly plants. I, I really don't like plants, just FYI. But they are an amazing system. I that's a soil scientist joke, right? So I realize y'all are not into soil scientist jokes tonight, right? But that plant is just phenomenal in that it blows my mind in that of all that energy and all that capacity that it takes to photosynthesize, on average, 50% of the sugar, 50% of the carbon it produces, it gives up freely to the soil to feed soil microorganisms. So it's an amazing, amazing system. Are we able to build and restore those stable aggregates? So this is, if you're wondering where this soil comes from, this is the Kiwani silt loam. This is when I was at Farm Tech Days at Ebert's. Do we have the beautiful granular structure? Is it able to accept water? Is it able to release water for plants because it has that right structure? And this is becoming more and more important as we think about climate change, right? So I came from Missouri prior to this. Am I? The slides are not progressing online. I will keep Sorry, talking. Gosh. So I came from Missouri prior to this, right? And so I'm used to getting 10, 12, 13 inches of rainfall in a 24-hour period. Y'all are not used to it. There you go. Y'all are not used to that, right? And, but we're seeing it become more and more common up here. And what happens? We end up with soil erosion. We end up with runoff. We end up with challenges such as that. Building soil health to accept that water and store that water and filter that water is part of the challenge that we can take and improve upon with improved soil health practices. So how do we build soil health? Right? How do we build soil health? You're notice you're going to see on the slides when we get them back the five soil health principles, but I like to simplify them to three, right? Soil is an ecosystem. It's as simple as feed it, clothe it, and don't poke at it, all right? That's how you make soils healthy, all right? So make sure that you have plants growing. Make sure they have organics coming into the system to support that microbial community. Make sure that it's covered to protect it from those intense rainfalls. So that raindrop is intercepted by crop residue, whether it be so dead crop residue or live plants, that the energy from that raindrop then gets dissipated to that plant and we can help to slow down erosion and try not to poke at it. Right? This is the beautiful thing about that ecosystem is if you look at it, oftentimes in a healthy soil that's forest derived, here's a question, get you all involved because you need to wake up, right? In a teaspoon of healthy forest soil, how many feet of fungal hyphae, the fungal threads, are out there? And they think on average. You always ask, we always ask you how many organisms are on a teaspoon of healthy soil. That's an easy one. You should have that memorized by now. 
But you've never probably been asked how many feet of fungal hyphae are in a teaspoon of healthy forest soil. Two, woefully underestimated. But thank you, sir, for your participation. <laughs> All right. Yo, yell it out. 5,280 feet. He went with a whole mile. He was a heck of a lot closer, but it's closer to 40 miles. So that's impressive. So every time you poke at the soil, you're just potentially disrupting up to 40 miles of fungus that is out. And everybody's like, oh, fungus. No, beneficial fungus that's helping to keep that soil alive. So this is what we're talking about. This is the five minute view of what soil health is. Is your soil doing what it's supposed to be doing? Then it probably is healthy. And if it's not, how do we make it healthier? Feed it, clothe it, and don't poke at it. So with that, Lauren, if you would like to take over, I'd like to introduce Lauren Bry from Bry Cycle Farm. Um, so again, I'm Lauren Bry, and our farm is located just south of Sturgeon Bay. It was established in 1904, and my husband and I, along with his brother and sister-in-law and our families, uh, are the fourth generation on our farm. And today we have about 650 dairy cows, 100 beef cattle, we run about 1,200 acres of cropland that's both owned and rented. We raise our own heifers as well as um, heifers for several other farmers. So that's kind of another uh, thing that we do. And we are running two uh, different sites for our farm. So um, they're about uh, eight miles apart, um, but again, both just south of Sturgeon Bay. Our farm has changed a lot over the years. And um, like many farms, when it was established, it there were hogs, chickens, um, cherry orchard, apple orchard. So um, kind of typical for Door County, but over the years has changed with different generations. Um, chose to focus on different things. So when my father-in-law came home from college, he was really passionate about dairy cattle. So that's where the farm uh, focused and that's where we continue to focus today. My husband Jacob and his brother Tony are really passionate about cattle, especially cattle genetics and registered Holsteins or the black and white cows. So that's um, something that's a little bit of a fun, fun hobby um, in addition to the main business of making milk and beef and cropping. We have really increased our focus on conservation over the last six plus years uh, since we started taking over the farm from the previous generation and um, we have been engaged with the Peninsula Pride Farms Group, which is the local farmer-led conservation group up here in Door and Kiwani County. We're also part of the Door Kiwani Demonstration Farms Network. Both of these organizations have really grown in the past few years and are a great way for us as farmers to get together and learn from one another. Um, I think those of you in your professions, you probably learn a lot from other people or you might be part of some professional association. So the same is true in farming, and these groups are just really focused on conservation, agriculture, and practices. So it's been a good way for us to um, hear what other farmers are doing and think about how we might implement some of those practices on our own farm, plus connect with experts like Jamie or um, Barry Bubbles, for example, with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Finally, um, I'll just touch on, we really enjoy being involved in our local community. We're um, very engaged with the Southern Door Farm to School Program. Um, my husband coaches the FFA dairy judging team, again, um, really into cows. Um, my brother-in-law coaches fourth grade basketball. We love to host farm tours. So lots of different things like that are um, what we like to do in our free time. So tonight the practice I'd like to highlight that uh, we're using on our farm, one of the many practices, is called management intensive grazing. And some of you may be familiar with a concept called rotational grazing. And this is very similar, but it's more of a targeted approach. Um, it's not just moving cattle from paddock to paddock on a certain day, but rather going out there every day and evaluating what the crop growth looks like. So estimating how much feed is out there for how many animals you have on that paddock and moving them at the appropriate time so that there's enough feed for the cattle, but also that the plants are at the right stage where they're not eaten down so much that they can't come back um, easily. So our goal is to do this from May through November. Um, we planted our first um, pasture in the fall of 2020. So last year, 2021, was our first year of having cattle out grazing. Uh, we had a group of pregnant heifers and young beef cattle out there. 
Um, our goal was one animal per acre. We just had 82, about 100 um, throughout, I sh it should say 2021. Obviously, I was doing this late last night, um, updating my slides, but um, we had about 80 to 100 animals out there last year. We'd like to increase that um, this next year, but that's uh, the goal with this um, concept. So why did we decide to try this? <laughs> Uh, first of all, it's allowing us to utilize some cropland that, yeah, it was good for growing crops, but it wasn't great. So it was also strategically located next to our heifer farm and the barns that these animals are in. So I think um, a lot of times people think, why can't you just go out and, you know, you should have all of your animals on pasture or more of them. Well, it has to also make sense. You have to have that land base and it has to be located somewhere that makes sense with your current infrastructure. So for us, we had... Um, some land that was right next to our barns that we had acquired. Um, so it made sense to try installing it into pasture. It's also <coughs> beneficial because it's allowing us to raise our animals for a lower cost per day, um, less labor. We don't have to scrape their barns every day. Um, we don't have to buy sand bedding and lower feed costs because we're not harvesting the feed, um, putting it in silage piles, mixing it. Um, they're just eating what's growing out there, and cover crops are um, a pretty affordable uh, seed mix, which is nice. Um, also, no need to haul manure, which is, again, another cost. The cattle are naturally fertilizing the land as they're out there grazing. Um, one piece I want to highlight, too, has been it's been surprisingly um, good for community engagement. Not that we aren't, again, engaged in our community, but... We um, live next to our heifer farm and right where, where all the pasture is. And this summer when I was out walking my daughter while I was on maternity leave, um, I would see people pulling over on the side of the road taking pictures of the animals out there grazing. It really is just a beautiful sight. There's a country church right across the road too. Um, so that view really never gets old. So what are the benefits of management intensive grazing? Uh, we're helping improve soil health. So we're not out there tilling the soil. As Jamie said, don't poke at it. Um, and we're using multi-species crop mixes. So all different kinds of plants going into the ground. Um, you'll see some of the plants that were in some of the mixes we used, um, if anyone's really interested in that. But I think the general point is that it's increasing the organic matter in the ground because the crop residue is being left out there. There's also root systems, especially from the things like turnips and radishes. Um, they're getting really large and they're really breaking up the soil, allowing for more water infiltration, plus cattle manure, organic fertilizer. It's all um, working together. It's good for the pregnant heifers because they're getting a little more exercise than they normally would. So it's helping them maintain a healthy body condition before they have their first calf. We're not using any chemical fertilizer or herbicides. Um, the density and diversity of those crop mixes are naturally suppressing the weeds. And I also like to point out that it's a cost savings. We're not paying for the inputs on those crops. We don't have to apply them. So we're saving fuel costs, we're saving hours on our tractors, we're saving um, manpower, all of those things. Um, and then the plants are growing and then um, as the cattle are eating them, they're digging some of them up, leaving them back out there, putting carbon back into the soil. Thank you, now thank you, Lord. So Lee, you're next. Sounds good. Um, per introduction, I am Lee Kennard. Um, my family and I own and operate Kennard Farms. We are a fifth generation dairy and crop farm, Belgian heritage. Um, really, uh, our ancestry dates back in our region to the 1850s when our uh, original ancestors immigrated into this area. Uh, kind of an interesting background. Um, at the very beginning, uh, about half of our family, uh, my mom's side, actually made their living as commercial fishermen. Um, my family, uh, my dad's side of the family, uh, was into the grains production. Uh, so kind of an interesting family dynamic. And indeed, uh, my mom's side of the family actually settled in uh, Door County uh, on the Bay side. So I think very early on, you know, there's some really interesting conversations uh, amongst our family, even five generations ago, about, okay, hey, what we can do on the land can indeed have a negative or a positive impact on the waters. So I think that really uh, focused a lot of what we do and what we believe. I think that really uh, uh, taught us where we were headed. Uh, so a little bit about our history. Uh, when mom and dad bought um, 
we actually, dad and mom, uh, dad was a World War II veteran, came back, didn't have the option of buying the home farm. His younger brother had actually taken over the home farm while he was in war, dispensation was on at that time. They didn't allow two children from the same family to go because there was a pretty good chance uh, neither would be coming home. Dad came home, married his high school sweetheart, my mom. Um, all they ever wanted to do was dairy, so they ended up buying a farm um, right next door to what was actually my dad's great-great-grandfather's, uh, great-great-great-grandfather's uh, home farm. So kind of an interesting uh, dynamic there. Started with 80 acres, 14 cows. To this day, uh, you know, we're somewhere around 11,500 acres of land that we farm. Uh, milking 7,500 cows. We've not had to go out and buy cows. Those cows are all related to those original 14. Uh, to our knowledge, we are the only herd in the world that's been able to have that kind of growth, and I really attribute that to, uh, to my parents, uh, the way they thought of caring for cows. Um, kind of a cool little story there. You know, our goal right now is we're about 1.5 acres per cow, really governed by always making sure we have plenty of feed. Uh, our breed of cattle that we choose is, is a registered Holstein, does really well with forage. So uh, we like using this climate to grow, it's phenomenal for growing really high quality forage. Uh, so we like about an acre and a half cow. Uh, that does not include heifers. Uh, about 16 years ago, we actually decided to bring heifers out of this area. Uh, we also own a ranch in Northeast Colorado. A lot of the same principles we talked about here. We've teamed with a seventh generation uh, farmer out in that region. He does the farming for us, but a lot of the same principles. Uh, we've been really lucky that over the years, uh, I guess uh, my dad's, my mom's uh, roots were Belgian. If you've ever known a Belgian, they're pretty frugal. Um, thus the use of advisors and consultants, which has really served us well. Uh, you know, a lot of these concepts that are fairly new, the uh, reason mom and dad decided to use advisors and consultants was they just didn't think it was wise that the person selling fertilizer, that the person selling feed, was also the person making the recommendations on your farm. Uh, that really was, you know, something started about 40, 45 years ago. I can't take credit for that, but it really has helped change our focus. Uh, <laughs> sustainability became a really big word. Uh, we actually coined the term on our farm. Uh, it was the guiding principle. We're, we're, we're a family farm, but we try to run things very formally. Smart sustainability was actually coined in 1990, and it was simply uh, all of those things in sustainability that, that are so common. Hey, it has to work for the community, it has to work for the environment, and it also has to work uh, economically. Um, we've really progressed here since about 2000, uh, really took a good hard look at where the world was going. And sustainable, on when we, when we use the metric of soil quality, uh, was not good enough. Uh, as Jamie said, uh, we, we've been uh, lucky to have heard Jamie many times over the years. Her comment about, we come from a region that was seven, eight, nine percent organic matter originally, and even with good farming practices, we were down to two percent. We simply knew that that was not sustainable and really started looking for, you know, what, what other answers do we have? Matt, you can forward please. So really what we've hit upon, and it's a fairly common practice, uh, it's becoming a fairly common practice, um, but pretty new to this region, uh, really, really catching fire and thanks through the groups and through the education of, of the folks we've been working with in some of these groups. Um, what we're doing is we are using the off season to grow a crop. So we grow our cash crop and it's harvested late summer, it's harvested late fall, early fall, and we immediately come in and plant another crop. Uh, the reason that we're throwing that crop out there is uh, multifaceted. Obviously, you know, if there's any nutrients left in that soil that were applied, otherwise just organic nutrients, we don't want them leaving the farm. So the crop that we plant does a really good job of sequestering those nutrients. It also does a great job of keeping that soil covered. You know, this is an actual uh, field that we're planting from this spring, trying to get some recent ones. You know, we're planting into a mat, quite often three to five feet tall of plant material. Um, we let that crop grow all the way through the winter and then on into the spring, trying to really maximize that off season. And we've actually developed our machinery so that we come right in and plant into uh, what would have considered, you know, even, even 20 years ago, that would have been considered impossible. What we're shooting for is every single year, we're trying to grow three to four tons 
of crop on every single acre that we don't harvest. What we're shooting for is that mat, that mulch. Those of you who are gardeners, we're really trying to grow our own mulch. Um, on the land that we've consistently been able to do this, we've been hitting one-tenth of a point of organic matter gain per year. You know, why is that important? Remember, it's going to take us at that rate 60 years to get back to where we were. And if you advance it one, we'll, we'll talk about why that is so important to the conversation we're having here. Um, uh, you know, let's go a little bit before we go there as to why, you know, why this hasn't been widely adopted and why it takes education and, and you know, why, why it's, it's not just <laughs> happening. Uh, you know, obvious number one, as farmers, you're business people, you do have to be able to make economics work. Um, there is the possibility that you're going to get some yield drag going into this on your first years of no-till, your first years of cover cropping. Um, you've really got to have some good education systems, some good peer groups where a farmer can talk to a farmer, where a farmer can talk to a scientist, a specialist, to let them know that this is not going to be a forever thing. There's going to be a little curve, and eventually the economics are going to work. Obviously, the other big problem is machinery investment. You know, the machinery we've invested in to do this, um, Fortunately for us, scale really helps in our favor. Uh, it's expensive, expensive machinery. I think, uh, you know, I think people have gotten very creative with the groups that are popping up about machinery sharing, custom cropping, those kinds of things, which is making it more readily available to the masses. Uh, you know, why, why go for this then? Um, obviously, there's some huge economics, uh, huge benefits immediately to the community, to the environment. You know, those things you just can't miss. They're, they're very obvious. Um, when we're looking at the commitment to the land, you know, I've been very lucky in that my family has always looked at it and said, okay, you know, this is not our land. We're simply the caretakers, and our goal is to leave the land in a condition better than when we found it. That's, that's been our goal from great-great-grandpa on down. Um, the tools to leave it in the truly better condition really didn't exist until probably 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, they were doing their best with conservation, but it wasn't good enough. Uh, so really, now, now when we look at things and say, okay, what's this going to look like 60 years from now? That's really the way we think. Fortunately, it is the way most farmers, actually all farmers that I know, think the exact same way. You know, I think uh, the commitment also comes a little easier because we do have the education that's come into our community telling us that, hey, you know, um, some of the things that we fear most, the economics, the, the what have you, um, they work, they work. Look at the science, work with the science. And uh, that's, I think, taken some of the blow and made things a little easier. Just kind of a cool little uh, tidbit in those pictures. Um, don't know if anybody knows what it is we're looking at there. Uh, can anybody take a guess what's in that guy's hand? That's actually my outdoor team manager. Um, dung beetle. Pardon? A dung beetle. Yeah, well, it's actually close. It's actually a worm casting. Worm. And uh, that crop was the better part of six and a half feet tall when we planted into it. We thought it was a disaster. We did not think we were going to get a crop. That was, it got away from us. It was a wet spring. That was harvest time. It was gone. There was the better part of a quarter inch to a half inch of new soil. I mean, it was phenomenal. We had never seen anything like that in 35 plus years of playing with these procedures. Go ahead and advance, please. You know, and that really is uh, what we're looking at. What are results? So we're, we're part of an interesting study, which is what this is all about. Uh, what we're actually doing there, the guy that uh, is kind of taking a selfie, I'm not sure what he's doing over there, uh, over in the upper right, um, he is measuring gas. So what he's doing is we've taken a 60-acre field that has been long-term no-till, long-term cover crop, long-term organic fertilizer. Um, we've divided this up into 30 different zones, different soil types, and we're actually measuring gas release. So we had to take this long-term no-till field, till one half of it, and farm it very aggressively using tillage, using practices that would have been considered very normal only a couple of years ago. And then the other half, this little R2-D2 looking robot, um, about a $40,000 little critter that is owned by the University of Wisconsin system, actually sniffs the soil and it can actually equate carbon sequestration or carbon release. 
Um, so that's a, a seven-year study that we've been you know, undertaking. We're on, on year number two of that. Uh, you know, I think the take-home message that we've seen is um, this carbon sequestration is real. Uh, when, we, when we went through and ripped the field for the very first time, we were just, it was, I hesitated to do it in the first place because it was really a successful long-term no-till field. When we saw the carbon that was released, it was, it was devastating when we sat down and looked at the results, but hey, it's part of the study and obviously trying to look forward. One more, please, Jamie. You know, so I think uh, the take home message, and I'm so glad to be here tonight, is uh, I, I really like speaking with groups like this, working with groups like this. You know, it, it, takes, it, it takes a different approach to farming. And, um, you know, farmers themselves are problem solvers, but they do need the tools, they need the science, they need the advice. I think some of our watershed groups, some of our demo farms things, the UW system, um, you know, has really brought agriculture forward very quickly. You know, I think one of the things that uh, I also stress is, you know, innovation over regulation. And, and what do I mean by that? So many of the rules that we have in place today are actually the biggest blocks to adopting some of these new practices. And it's very frustrating to be an agriculturist and to very clearly see there's a better way, but it doesn't fit into a mold. Um, you know, that's devastating when, when a well-intended regulation ends up really blocking forward progress. You know, and I think, uh, again, collaboration. So glad to be here tonight. Thanks for, you know, for having me. Um, I look forward to future talks, and, uh, you know, I, I think really wonderful things can happen. Thank you. Thank you, Lee, if you'll turn off your microphone. So I just wanted to take a quick moment. So we've been talking a little bit about poking the soil and tilling the soil and the release of carbon. So I just want to take a second and explain why that occurs. So when you look at that no-till system that Lee was talking about, in normal soil systems, quote unquote, normal soil systems, right, the soil environment is fairly oxygen poor. And so what that oxygen poor environment does is it suppresses microbial activity. The microbes can only eat that organic matter at a certain rate because they don't have enough oxygen to breathe, just like we're breathing right now. So what happens when we till the soil is we introduce oxygen into the system. We fluff it up, that oxygen gets into the system. That's what the microbes needed in order to break down the organic matter. That was the limiting factor. And so organic matter starts to just fly away and you measure that as carbon dioxide coming out of the system because what was suppressing microbial activity, the lack of oxygen, now is plentiful through tillage. And so that's why tillage can lead to the long-term decline in soil organic matter is that introduction of oxygen into a fairly oxygen poor environment. So hopefully that makes a little sense and that's part of my job is to make sure that we understand the concepts as we move through these slides. So with that, Shar, you're next, so if you'll, if you'll turn on your microphone for me. My name is Shar Banke. My husband Dan's in the back of the room. My son Tay is here virtually, and we are the owners of Mighty Wind Farms. We are located just north of Sister Bay on Waters End Road, and we are the newbies on the block. Um, our, my husband and I actually purchased our land in 2014, and at the time it was horse pasture. So we always knew we wanted to farm. So we thought, let's just start doing what we want to try doing, which would be starting to do um, various crops of vegetables and fruits and so on. And whatever's left over, we'll sell to the community. Well then, um, so we decided to start with fruit. And in 2016, we started planting fruit trees and also some uh, bushes and brambles. And it was pretty experimental. We have a lot, a lot of very different types of fruits that we're experimenting with because not being from here, we're from southeastern Wisconsin, we had no idea what we were getting into. So then in uh, 2019, our son Tay, who was working out in North Carolina, decided he wanted to come back to Wisconsin and he went to school for agriculture and wanted to farm. And we were very excited because not only was he coming home, but he was going to be pushing us along into this endeavor. So in 2020, because of Tay, we also uh, started planting vegetables. And the goal was to do a farmer's market and see where it takes us. And because our property was a horse pasture, we had to 
we had to get the dirt to where we needed it for our fruits and vegetables. And so, um, uh, having grown up in, when my mother was a gardener, a very good gardener, and I watched her compost. That's how she, she took dirt that was full of clay and um, got it to the point where the year she was moving, she like, she's like, my dirt is perfect now. And now she's moving. <laughs> so she had to start all over again. But she enjoyed that. And, and I saw what that did with the dirt, and so we knew that that's what we had to go with here. Um, we also knew that because we are three people, we weren't going to be getting enough organic matter to, to do this, so we started brainstorming and decided that we would reach out to the restaurants in the area. So um, we contacted them, and they just, we, we would give them five pound buckets or we give them garbage pails and depending on the size of the restaurant they give us their kitchen scraps they give us their coffee grounds and we go and pick those up once or twice a week depending how quickly they fill them up and then we realized we could go further with this so we invited the community to get involved in this and so when we opened up last year was our first year 2021 was the first year we had our market room open so we have a canister outside our market room, and people are invited to just drop by and drop off all of their kitchen scraps. And um, we've had very good success, actually, with that. Um, and we wanted to grow organically, so that was important to us. We're not certified organic, but we wanted to grow, follow the organic practices. So we opened our market room, started having people come. We also do the Sister Bay Farmer's Market once a week. That goes from late June to early October and may expand that depending how it goes for us. Then also um, we, um, I've always been a chicken person. I think chickens are my spirit animal actually. Yeah. <laughs> I just love chickens. And so we have about 110 chickens and we knew we wanted those not, and they're laying hens. We knew we wanted those not only to produce eggs that we could sell, but we also wanted their manure. Manure is great, especially if you're composting. It's, it's a necessary element to that. So um, the, the manure uh, is, is needed in order to get that compost to heat up to the point where it's going to break down. And chicken's manure is very high in nitrogen, which is great. And you want to have a, a 30 to one, for great compost, you want it to be a, a 30 to one ratios of um, carbons to ni uh, nitrogens. So not only are you have your greens and your browns, I'm sure you're familiar with your greens and browns if you're composting, but then you need the manure to get it to work. And what is composting? Well, composting is a mix of ingredients that helps improve soil health, and that's basically what it is. Um, the difference between compost and a fertilizer is that compost feeds the soil, while fertilizer feeds your plants. And so in order to use compost, you, in order to use your raw materials, you don't necessarily put them directly onto your gardens. That's not where you, we wanted to go with this. We wanted to have it composted down first and then be putting it onto our gardens. And because this was horse pasture, we knew what we were growing, we knew what we we're gonna to need to do, and if you know Door County, you know it's rocky, especially when you get to the northern part up here, and you know you need more dirt. And composting isn't just going to help the soil, it's going to create soil. It's exactly what you just said. It helps your plant quality, and as my son, and I'm quoting him, you can only be as productive as your soil is, and that's very, very true. Uh, success is determined upon how good your soil is. So what, is, what are the benefits of composting? It replenishes necessary nutrients that the plants use to grow. It creates beneficial bacteria and fungus. We've discussed that tonight. It discourages weeds, disease and pests, and it keeps organic waste out of the landfills. Um, so, and by organic waste, it's the, the kitchen scraps and those types of things, anything that's compostable. So we also do small farm tours on our farm, and we, um, it's like 10, 15 minutes, because we're not very big, but 
it just gives you an idea of how we're doing it because there are multiple ways of composting. And it also sees how it benefits our gardens. It's amazing what's happened. We've only had two growing seasons. That's all the longest we've been around. But it's amazing in that time period how much better our dirt has become because of the composting that we've been doing. So. Excellent. Thank so. Thank you so much, Shar. I'm going to start with the first question. So remember, panelists, to turn on your microphone when you decide to talk. So um, our weather is changing from storm frequency and intensity to record-breaking temperatures in both directions. How is climate change and changing weather patterns currently impacting your farm, one? And how are you adapting your farming practice to become more resilient to these changes? So if you can give us examples of how climate, climate change is directly impacting your farm. Who would like to start? I'll say something. All right. Thanks, Char. I guess the first thing we noticed was the last, this, especially this last year, how dry it was in the beginning of our summer. Um, we were constantly, we, this is, that was the first year we actually had drip tape. The year before we were actually watering, taking hoses out and watering, it was, it was something. But um, we noticed how dry it was and we, the drip line was great, but we were constantly watering. Well, the minute you're adding compost or doing what you're doing with your fields, the retention of water is so much better. So there's one point right there, if anyone has anything else. I'll just add to um, echo and ditto what Char said. Um, just the different weather makes it more challenging to plant crops at the right time. And I think in Door County, we have um, a little bit of a shorter growing season than other areas. Um, I actually grew up on a farm in southern Wisconsin, and I'm used to much longer summers, it seems like. So um, just a shorter growing season um, makes it more challenging to get all the work done, honestly, or um, maybe sometimes get your crops where you need them to be. So I think um, what we are doing is trying to adapt as many um, or adopt as many practices as we can to um, help mitigate climate change, to put more carbon in the soil, to help our soils be resilient um, because we want to continue farming here. Um, we want uh, our families to be able to do that in the future. Um, and in order to do that, we have to do something different. We have to be better. Every day is an opportunity to learn. That's why we uh, work with, uh, as Lee said, different advisors. We use our resources like UW Extension is a wonderful resource we have here in the state. Um, they have a research station here in Door County. I think that's awesome. Um, so just thinking about what can we do differently today uh, that will improve our farm and make it better. I think the thing that uh, most sticks out in my mind is the intensity of rains. Um, you know, we've got tracking, uh, my dad and my grandfather were really big on tracking on the farm. And there's, there's no doubt about it. The intensity, the durations has absolutely changed. And, uh, you know, we, we, we still do a fair amount of conventional. You, you can't automatically convert everything over, but it's just shocking to me. Um, you get one of these heavy rain events and uh, you, you go out and you actually look in the fields, you do the walking through the fields, and it is amazing to me, you know, the soils <laughs> in long-term no-till, those soils with the cover crop green and growing, how they are able to handle those without actually giving up, losing the soil. Um, that's been, especially in those long-term no fields, it's it, no-till fields, it's, it's night and day. It's an absolute, you cannot believe the difference until you see it yourself. And with that, uh, these same intense rain events, farmers still have to get out there in these very short windows when the crop is optimum. We still need to get out there and get the crop harvested. And I think that's been a really huge advantage uh, as far as the soil. The soil is, is you know, such a great structure that it actually carries things after these weird weather events. Machinery, you know, far better than if we were tilling those fields. So that's been our big changes. So this one is directly towards Lee, but please, anyone else who would like to uh, chime in? Can you get, Lee, can you give an example of regulations preventing good sustainable farming practices as you stated? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're a dairy farm, um, so we produce a lot of manure. And, you know, 35, 40 years ago, um, uh, farmers in our community, in all communities, you know, we were, we were using a lot of water, uh, dairy farms especially, and that water was ending up in some very undesirable places. And, uh, you know, I think that the common, um, bought a lot of farms over the years, the common practice was, hey, there's a tile line that mysteriously gets rid of the water. And you always find these things when you're taking down an old farm structure. Regulations answer to that was, hey, why don't we add this water to the manure, call it liquid manure, and handle it that way. Um, my dad was very proud. He was one of the very first people <clears throat> to install liquid manure containment. Hey, instead of hauling all winter, worrying about runoff, worrying about groundwater infiltration through the winter months, he was very proud. But he very early on, you know, sat with our advisors and they said, okay, but at some point, we're no longer handling manure. We're handling watery manure. And that's gonna mean we're gonna have to chase away from no-tilling land, from handling manure in that manner. We're gonna have to totally change the way this is handled. We're gonna be doing intensive tillage to keep the rainwater in place. And, and that time has come. You know, when I look at the water we collect today, it is tenfold what my parents collected. You know, we now have a manure that is 97% plus water. And that's fine from a standpoint of the collection, but if long term, if, if we're gonna collect things, rainwater, you know, uh, we collect uh, about a third of our manure is indeed rainwater off of our feed beds. It's a great practice. That manure, that water is not pure. Regulation right now says, hey, that's manure. The problem with that is it, it's not manure, and it really changes the way we farm. Ideally, there'd be an outlet other than calling it manure. Um, until the regulation catches up, innovates, and allows the innovation to handle that water, just about pure water, as something other than manure, it does hold back the adoption of no-till and cover cropping. You know, so I think, uh, I, I, well intended, very well intended, but unfortunately farmers weren't sitting at the table when those regulations were designed. And I think, again, we go back to collaboration, working on these things together. You know, I think, I think farmers, my dad for certain, you know, said, hey, at some point, this is, this is a bad practice. So I think, you know, again, let's, let's, let's innovate, let's have farmers sitting at the table when we make these rules, and I think forward progress would be a lot faster. Thank you, Lee. Lauren or Shar, you wanna add? You, no, okay. <laughs> so actually, Shar, I'm directing this one to you. So first, congratulations on your compost system. So that's what's coming out of my phone, and I do want to congratulate you. I get really excited. As a side note, I love the idea of composting food waste. What a brilliant idea to improve soils. When you think about how much food is wasted out of restaurants, casinos, whatever it may be, wow, what a great thing to put back on the soil, but now back to the question. Is there an interest in forming cooperatives of small to medium farms to distribute your products to a larger boutique market, such as Chicago, Madison, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, where you could get higher prices? Well, that's kind of a loaded question, but first of all, you'd have to be able to bring enough in to get composted down to be able to sell it and so on, to be a very big project. But also it comes down to the rules and regulations of how that ha would have to be handled. So it's not something you can just do. Um, it has to, you have to go through all the, as you said, everything that has to be done in order to complete a project like that. And on a small scale such as us, I don't think that we could handle that, just having three people on our farm. But it's done. We, we actually started, compo we, we had bought compost our first year, and we just simply weren't as happy as, with it as we thought it could be. Just didn't seem to be what we needed. And so that's one of the reasons we started doing more of it on our own. But to get it out there to bigger, to other cities, it would be a massive undertaking. It isn't simply something we could do. 
On to our next question. So whoever would like to, to answer this, remember to turn on your microphone. And it's probably for all of you. What percent of your total area of your cropland is cover cropped and or in conservation practices? So acres, percentage, however you would like to report that. Who would like to start? Lauren? I'll attempt to answer it. Jacob um, is the person who handles all the cropping, but his goal is 100% of our acres in cover crops. Um, depending on the weather, you can't always get there because you have to be able to harvest your crops and then plant something in. And um, again, it's weather dependent and when you're sometimes a uh, one man show in the planting or two people doing it, um, it's hard to get that done. But I think um, last year we probably had over 80% of our acres had cover crops on them. Um, but again, our goal would be 100% of the acres if we could get there. Um, and I think if we can do at least one conservation practice on all of our acres, we are doing it. Um, if not more than one, um, that's something that's being talked about a lot more now and promoted is called stacking practices. So that is pretty much doing as much as you can. Um, so if that's planting a cover crop um, into a living crop, so the planting green that Lee had beautiful pictures of, um, you know, that stacking practices, and then if you're doing like a low disturbance manure application into that, um, different things like that, trying to do multiple practices on um, the same acres is, I think, extra beneficial. Lee or Shar, would you like to add to it? Yeah, sure. We're, um, you know, we've been averaging for the last 11 years, we're about 68% covered. It varies. You know, depending on the year, widely, as, as Lauren said, um, you know, depends on what the weather is, those kinds of things. Our goal is 100%. We're, you know, we're firmly, we're firmly in the court that this is the way for us to farm. Um, you know, to the point of, of getting there, it is, it is absolutely going to take, again, innovation, uh, uh, technology. You know, it's going to take, uh, in our case, it's going to take a rethinking of manure, it's going to take water removal from the manure. Um, I think uh, I think that's where the future is going to lie on that, and I think the guy could pretty safely year in and year out get very very close to that 100 percent. So that is our goal. Even in 2019. Uh, 2019. Wow. Does anybody remember 2019 uh, except me? As I was say, holy moly, was that a wet fall? Those of you who farms are all nodding, going, oh. So this is where, when it comes back in, so climate change has a huge impact, and that weather has a huge impact on how many acres actually get cover cropped in a season. In 2019, surprise, you're still not crying about that one. I am, because soil compaction around the region made me, kept me up at night, um, because the fields were so wet, and we were trying to get crops out of the field, cover crops planted, manure applied, so on and so forth. So climate change is having a huge impact on whether or not these conservation practices are going out on the ground. So just poking a little bit at you there, sir. So, but this is, you're doing a great job, but the question is, is how can we increase the number of acres or producers that are adopting soil health and regenerative ag practices? So what is it gonna take to get everyone on board? You know, in our case, uh, no, but, um, you know, I think, I think the take home here is that to be truly sustainable, we aren't looking for an outside reward, an outside input uh, that kind of you know, defies the definition of sustainability. So no, at this time, uh, there is no reward um, for the practices. There are some up and coming carbon markets that are beginning. Uh, I don't know where those, where those are gonna end up. Um, you know, what we really look for is again, the economic portion of sustainability is, you know, we know that economically we're growing a crop with less inputs, less dollars, less fuel, less tractor, and that's really where our reward comes from. Um, so that's kind of how we look at it. So the, the question was compensation. So are you being compensated? Are you being encouraged financially? There are some cost sharing programs out there for farmers who might want to try some of these practices, but they're um, not, you know, it's not huge payments um, to do something. You're not going to make a profit by getting some cost share dollars, but there are some programs, whether it's through NRCS or a farmer led um, group in the area, um, maybe other programs. Um, but I think 
to Lee's point, while we're not necessarily getting like a financial payment from any organization or institution for the practices that we might be implementing, I think um, the return we're seeing on soil health, um, water quality, um, knowing that we're improving the land for the future viability of our farms, that's um, I think what's more important in um, thinking about it for the long term and for the future. Um, you're doing it because it's the right thing to do and um, it makes sense in all aspects. It's good for the environment, it's good economically with less inputs, um, for example, and it's um, just good for the community to have a better environment as well. And I guess for, for me, when I think about what we've done in this little bit of time is the reward we get I guess it com comes from the feedback of the community that comes to our farm and brings the, the, the their scraps to our farm. I mean, we have so many excited people. We had someone, goodness, she's gotta be in her 80s and she was so excited because she went and bought a compost bucket, a real compost bucket. And she just feels like she's contributing to this also. So it's not going into a landfill, it's going to a farm. And you know, it's, it, it's really been an easy process for us. So I guess, for me, that would be the reward, is how much other people have seen this and enjoy it and just think how important it is. All right, so I have a question about hauling manure. So when we get back to climate change and carbon offsets, so if you're hauling manure to spread on fields more than 15 miles away, how are you able to offset those, that carbon release from burning the fossil fuels? Well, and you know, uh, obviously, therein lies part of the issue. Uh, manure is fertilizer, uh, so it's really important, uh, you know, one way or the other. Uh, matter is not created nor destroyed. If you're going to remove fertilizer from a field, you've got to replace it. Manure is our our option. It's it's our fertilizer of choice. Uh, we have a very simple mass balance we use. We grow all of this feed on 11,350 acres, I think is what we ran last year. We harvest the feed, and <clears throat> as the feed is harvested, we actually run it right across the scale. We know exactly how much was removed. We geo-reference that back to the exact acre it came from. We also have a lab that real time tells us what the food quality was. It actually tells you how many nutrients were removed from that acre. So it is very easy to you know, then put those nutrients back. Our manure, when we think about that mass balance, is only about 45% of the fertilizer needs. When you think about this, we're producing milk, we're producing meat. So every day, we're exporting nutrients off the farm. So we only have about half of what we need. And we're gonna be forced, faced one way or the other with the decision, you've gotta replenish those nutrients either with manure or commercial fertilizer. You know, and in my mind, it's a, it's a pretty clear cut when we talk about uh, carbon footprint, which of those is going to win. Um, whether we're bringing in something that was mined in Canada, something that was, you know, made petrochemical, um, it, it's a pretty clear thing. I think you can afford to move manure quite a, quite a distance. Um, but also, uh, you know, that again goes back to the technology. You know, we're trucking a product that is 97% water. Um, we are toying with some technology right now and it's just amazing to me that you remove that water and it becomes very, very, very efficient. You know, I've seen some studies saying, hey, you know, that's an organic fertilizer that could very easily um, be moved three and four hundred miles down the road without a problem. So when we think about water, so how are you, what, how are your practices protecting the wells? our groundwater, and what practices do you see being implemented in the next 10 years or so to help us protect groundwater quality in the, in the area? Yeah, I think, um, you know, soil health, it's amazing to me. Uh, you know, we live in a region that, um, uh, you know, it was fairly common. Uh, dairy cow numbers haven't changed all that much over the last 50 or 100 years. So in particular, when we're talking manure and recycling those nutrients, um, it really comes down to, you know, how are, we, how are we handling those nutrients? Are we applying them to the right fields, the fields that need the nutrients at the right time? And I think even more importantly, 
I think, are we applying this to a soil that is going to absorb and handle those nutrients very well? Uh, I think that's, that's where I struggle with the concept of let's add ever more water to manure because it makes you destroy the principle of let's not till, let's not poke that soil. Let's, you know, let's, let's follow the practices that we know promote soil health. You know, so to that end, um, again, we are, personally, we're really looking into technology and saying, okay, there's got to be a better way than handling ridiculous amounts of water because, you know, if we can go back to 100% not poking that soil, you know, what is manure? It is our compost. I mean, it's a uh, nature's perfect way of fertilizing a soil. I'll just add some of the practices that we're using. So cover crops are protecting your soil, um, trying to have a growing crop on the land 365 days a year. So when it does rain, hopefully you have better water infiltration. Um, and one of the technologies, um, there's a lot of different kinds of toolbars out there for applying manure. Um, so that's been really cool to see. There's actually one that you can rent from Outagamie County. So um, we rent that one when it's available to do some low disturbance manure applications. So that's basically applying the manure um, at the right place. Again, as Lee said, the four R's, right place, right rate, right time. I'm probably, mis I'm missing Right rate. Okay. So um, that toolbar will just inject the manure right at the root zone of the crop. Um, so we're seeing a lot of um, experimenting with tools like that to um, get it right where the plant can use it and um, help hopefully protect the water as well. So I think just a lot of different technologies that we can try, but we have to be able to access them. So sometimes they're very expensive. So how can we as groups of farmers get together um, and equipment share, things like that, um, are things we need to keep looking at to continue to improve. All right. So back to climate change. So one of the ways recommended to deal with climate change is for people to consume less animal-based products, meat, meat, milk, eggs. How do you see your farming practices changing if this shift begins? You know, I guess um, <clears throat> I'm a dairy farmer. My family is a dairy farmer for the reason that a ruminant is a pretty incredible way to feed the world. And um, you know, I think it's very short-sighted to say that you know, if we stop eating meat, this thing changes around. Um, you know, I'm very proud, uh, on our farm, we actually measured the metrics. In 1996, we crossed the threshold where we could grow carrots, we could grow beets, we could grow a consumable by a human and produce so many calories of a usable protein. Um, Interestingly enough, by growing the forage and using the animal as the tool, as the multiplier of those calories, um, that ruminant, all that simply means is that a cow can consume cellulose. She can eat things that you or I would starve to death on and very efficiently converge, convert huge pounds of dry matter that we can't even think about producing in a vegetable form, something directly consumable by the human, and she can very efficiently convert that over and multiply, thus actually you know, reducing total acreage needed to feed people. And you know, I think on top of that, the cow has some pretty cool characteristics that she brings to the table. There's an awful lot of waste things that a ruminant can consume. You know, I think of some of the products the beer industry is huge in Wisconsin. You know, 20 years ago, um, if you brewed beer, you malted barley. Uh, the barley industry was huge here. That's why the beer industry was as big as it was. Um, when you malted barley, you basically soaked it, you set it to seed, you dried it off, and that became your enzymes, your flavor for the beer. Um, it was only 20, 25 years ago that all of that product ended up in a landfill. You know, pretty, pretty non-sustainable. Um, nutritionists figured out that, hey, let's take that product. I'm willing to bet the cow can extract. It's become a very valuable feed. So there's, you know, that added, added concept uh, to animal agriculture. I think it's really important not to overlook those things when we say it's an all or nothing 
uh, venture here. Uh, so in my mind, you know, I really hope that we measure and, and really take those things seriously and, and look at the big picture before we, you know, before we say, hey, all or nothing is, is going to solve the issue. Sure. Lauren, would you like to add anything? Okay. Well, we'll stay along that, that realm. So greenhouse gas emissions from farms typically include carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. We hear a lot about methane generation from livestock and livestock waste. Are you measuring methane production on your farm? Are you thinking about it? Are you thinking about strategies to reduce methane emissions on your farms? Yes, I think most farmers um, are thinking about a lot of different things that we need to be doing, and this is one of them that we're really hearing more about. Um, there are some new feed products that supposedly can reduce methane emissions. I think most Everybody's pretty skeptical of those claims. I think there are there's some research being done on some of the products. I know one of them had research done at UC Davis, for example. But in order to measure the methane emissions from the cows, the cows have to have their like heads in a gas in some sort of chamber to measure it for part of the day. So to feasibly do that on a farm, I don't on like a farm all the time. I don't know how we would measure our emissions um, if there was an easy way to do it maybe, but I don't know of that technology. Um, but I know we have considered some of those feed products to try. Um, they supposedly also increase feed efficiency. Um, but there are other ways that we can also look at some of this, like um, animal genetics is something that we're really passionate about. How do we improve the genetics of our herd so that our animals use less feed um, while still producing um, a lot of milk? So um, that's a trait we can actually select for when we're choosing the sires or the fathers of our of our cattle. Um, we, act, we genomic test all of our animals, so we're taking little tissue samples and they can predict um, different traits that those animals will have, which is again allowing us to think about some of those um, things I think in a different way and maybe methane emissions may be a trait someday, I don't know. Um, but those are some of the things we're thinking about, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, in terms of mass adoption. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I know uh, obviously when you're talking methane, you're talking two different sources. Uh, there are different sources when we're talking uh, a decomposition of uh, uh, an aerobic lagoon, um, or if we're talking entric, you know, the cow burp itself. Um, <clears throat> some pretty fascinating stuff coming out on that cow burp. Um, you know, I do think there's going to be some things, in addition to the things Lauren listed, the genetics, what have you, I think there's some pretty exciting research done uh, with some pretty simple products that really seem to have a lot of, a lot of promise. Um, on the lagoon end of things, I guess, uh, you know, in my vision, I think animal agriculture has to rethink manure handling. You know, I think... Um, I think simply saying, hey, this, this is the, the one size fits all, I'm not sure that's necessarily the, the right way to look at things. Um, you know, in our case, we're using a methane digester. Obviously, it's, it's not something that everybody can utilize. It's, it's got to be a certain size and a certain scale. It's a huge investment. It does a really good job of capturing, you know, off of fresh manure. Uh, really simple process. All you're doing is you're, you're heating the volume of manure, the vat of manure, and instead of decomposition taking place over the next six, nine, 12 months, um, you're causing that methane to release immediately, um, capturing that methane, scrubbing it, it's chemically equivalent to natural gas. Um, so that, that, you know, it's a solution for some, but again, it's, it's not gonna be a one size fits all. Um, I think I'm, much more looking long term, you know, that we've maybe got to rethink, you know, how we store manure to get rid of those emissions at some point. Thank you very much. 
Well, our time has hit 8.31, so I just wanted to, the, the Nature Conservancy actually popped into my notes here, and they wanted to let you know there was a cover crop question earlier on. The Nature Conservancy wanted us to know that the farmer-led group that Lee and Lauren are part of, which is Peninsula Pride Farms, started in 2016 with 4,000 cover crop acres, and we're up to 47 of the 54 farms planted cover crops in the past year, and they've had a seven-fold increase in the amount of cover crop adoption. So talking about the power of those farmer-led groups and talking about the power of that collaborative nature of the agricultural community. So I know we didn't get to all the questions. We apologize. I don't know about you, but the whole hour and a half flew by for me, and uh, there's plenty of questions still popping into my phone as well as, this, as, the, as my list. So if I can, can I get a round of applause and a thank you to Lee, Lauren, and Char. As, as well as well to the Door County Climate Change Coalition for hosting this event. And hopefully it's one of many to come forward as we move forward in our communities. Education and communication is key to solving our problems. And so making sure that we can have forums like this to discuss what we want to discuss is important. So I think you said 99% of everything that needs to be said. I would like to re welcome Representative Joel Kitchens here. I think it's important for our government officials to be hearing this information. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all the rest of you of coming. It affirms the importance of the agricultural uh, base on which we're all dependent. And it, there's a lot to learn and a lot to share. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.